This is Sammy Morris, University Archivist, interviewing Laura Clavio for the Purdue Oral History Program. The date is May 18, 2016. Laura, thank you for joining us today. Uh, first, I thought we could talk a little bit about your background, just um, to get on the record where you grew up and where you went to school. Oh, okay. Um, I went to, uh, I was born in Clinton, Indiana, uh, which is uh, about 15 miles north of Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, I went to grade school and high school there, and then I attended um, Indiana University uh, and majored in radio, TV, and speech theater there. Radio, TV, and speech theater. So what did you do after graduation? After graduation, um, my first job after graduation was um, on the founding staff of um, what was then called WBAK-TV, Channel 38, in Terre Haute, Indiana. And I had a variety of positions there while I was there. I believe I, gosh, ancient history here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I believe I started there as sales secretary, and then I became the uh, traffic manager and production assistant, and I also did on-the-air work there um, the Dialing for Dollars movie, oh, and wow. um, um, substitute weather person, those wow. kinds of things. So it sounds like you were a little bit behind the scenes as well as on camera, Yes, doing a little bit of it all. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exciting. How did you first become affiliated with Purdue? Where, what, what time period and in what capacity? Let's see, we moved to uh, the Lafayette area in 1985, and I uh, became a part-time employee of the Department of Horticulture in 1986, um, working on, and that was a temporary position, but I was working on the uh, National Herb Growing and Marketing Conferences as one mm. of the conference coordinators. Did you, do you know how long that had been established? I know you mentioned It was brand was new. new. So do, any background that they gave you on how that came to be? Uh, it, it, I think that the professor, James Simon, was interested in creating an academic conference, actually, um, uh, about uh, growing herb crops for, for profit. Uh, he was an extension agent in the horticulture department. But what actually happened was uh, the conference attracted far more people than they ever imagined from non-academic groups, such as... Um, herb growers, gardeners, uh, crafters, uh, just uh, medicinal people, uh, just a whole hodgepodge of hmm. people. And that first year, we had over 600 people out at um, University Place. It was wow. just absolutely jammed. And um, while there were some academic papers that were presented, uh, it certainly didn't turn into the uh, kind of academic conference that anyone had imagined. Interesting. And so it, it was a, it was a very exciting uh, time, and I think you know Purdue became part of of the whole burgeoning herb industry uh, scene that um, just kind of blew up from that point. Yeah. So this was one of the first um, uh, meetings of this kind, uh, and. Um, Wow, we had we had a lot of conflict, conflicting point of points of view on uh, what herbs should be, and a lot of mistrust between uh, academics and non-academics. So oh. it was a very interesting dynamic. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> had you been interested in herbs before taking the job? Yes, I had. I had uh, actually worked with the extension agent in Vermilion County, and we'd put on some um, workshops okay. about herbs. And uh, and Dr. Simon actually came down and made a presentation to one of those one time, um, but I didn't meet him again until um, I came up here, and when I heard the um, herb conference was happening, I volunteered that first year just because I wanted to go, so I had volunteered to be um, uh, a helper, yeah. and uh, he apparently didn't have much good help from his graduate students, so he ended up hiring me to help him coordinate the conference, and I did that for the next three years, I believe. So was that first year it was held 86, or was it before you came in 85? No, the first year was 86. 86, okay. Mm -hmm. 
That's that's interesting. So how has it evolved? Does it still exist? I'm not sure that it still oh. exists. Um, after a while, a national herb growing and marketing organization was created, mm -hmm. and they took over administration of it. So oh, it moved okay. on from here. Oh, that's really neat that mm -hmm. you were involved from the beginning. Um, well, I guess we can skip on from there to, did you, did you have any roles between horticulture and when you began with convocations? Uh, yes, that job ended, and um, so I had other work away from the university until um, I applied for this position uh, in 1997. Okay. And what was, so it, the position that you applied for at the time is the same as the t your title is now? No, at yeah. that time I was production assistant. Production assistant, okay. And what were some of your main duties then? I was what we would affectionately call babysitter to the stars. <laughs> oh, I see. So I'm assuming you um, have a good temperament. <laughs> uh, basically responsible for making sure that um, all of the, um, uh, working with the technical crew to make sure that, that the writer information from the artist had been met as far as the requirements for the show. Mm -hmm. um, taking care of catering and transportation and hotel, all the you know mm -hmm. different accommodations that we needed for the artists. Um, working with um, agents and whoever else was involved, um, production managers, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, to um, just make sure everything was coordinated so the show went smoothly while they were here and that they had a good experience while they were at Purdue. It sounds like um, a lot of multitasking and, and keeping people happy. It turned um, out to be that, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so I can see why um, you moved up the ladder there. When did you when did you um, go up from Convocations Production Assistant to Assistant Director? Well, um, actually, that was in 2000. However, in 1999, I took over... Um, being the advisor to the student concerts committee. So at that time, I took on a lot of the things that um, I actually more officially had as assistant director later on. Mm. Um, and that was, um, I took over programming duties for uh, the student concert committee and um, and then being the staff advisor for, for that group. Okay, so that became part of your position as assistant director. Yes. And formerly those had been separated out. Or, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> um, well, tell me a little bit about your work on programming. Like, did you have, how did you set priorities for, for programming? Was there, is there like a committee that decides, you know, we're going to bring in these people or are there goals or a vision for the kinds of things you're wanting to, to bring in and do? Um, I'm not, I'm, it's a totally mysterious process to me. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I, my only, I mean, I, while I did give opinions and advice on, on some of the brochure, mm -hmm. um, what we call the brochure programs, which were at that time mostly series, classical, Broadway, jazz, those kinds mm -hmm. of things, um, those really weren't what I was programming. Um, my primary function was um, to do family entertainment, mm -hmm. school matinees, and then um, all of the things that were involved with um, touring performances such as rock and roll, comedy, country okay. shows. That, uh -huh. So the, I kind of had the two ends of the spectrum, the, the family and, and school, and then the big um, touring shows that were really not capable of being booked uh, in a brochure type situation because the time frame involved obviously for the brochure is a much longer time frame mm -hmm. uh, than, than those shows normally book. So mm -hmm. so um, that was kind of a, a different area that had to be covered. I see. Okay. So the family and school, um, we've, we had begun originally doing separate family shows and separate school matinees mm -hmm. because the material just um, that was available to us was um, really geared to two different things. And it, um, we found that family shows were really popular, but 
some of them really didn't lend themselves well to school, meaning school um, objectives and uh -huh. curriculum. Um, at the same time, we found that families were interested in attending the shows that we were bringing for school matinees. And, uh, and finally, for economic reasons more than anything, uh, we decided to combine those. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with a formula where we um, chose a program that could function both as a Sunday matinee for families, and then Monday we would usually put two school matinees on during the day oh. so that uh, we could have um, school groups bus into campus. Mm -hmm. And that has worked pretty well over the years. It took us maybe maybe five years or so of trying different things before that was the, the formula that we came up with. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's a little bit limiting in that um, there's a broader scope of family entertainment that we could bring. Mm -hmm. And occasionally we do by, for instance, bringing in a, um, a performance of a Sesame Street or mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a bigger um, children's um, program like that. Uh, but for the most part, um, we've gone really from doing five or six of these a year now to doing three most of the time. I see. So because it's more grouped with the with the family activity and then the curricular. Right. Uh -huh. um, and and we've you know the shows have gotten better and 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 responded to those needs I think more over the years as well. So it's been easier to find things that could fit into both of those formats. Mm -hmm. And then um, we added to that, um, maybe 10 years ago, um, a pre-show activity. Mm -hmm. So we could not only um, make it a more of an afternoon uh, for the families to come and, and participate, but then we could also highlight partnerships with the community or with uh, different groups on campus, either departments oh, yeah. or clubs or something that fit the theme of the show. For instance, mm -hmm. um, let's take Jack Hanna, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, he would come to town, very generous man, and um, he might do a performance for the employees of the hotel just as a bonus. Um, he would send his uh, some of his staff out to speak to um, classrooms on campus that had interest in wow. animal care. Mm -hmm. And then for the pre-show, we might have the Columbia Zoo, petting zoo come and be in the mm -hmm. lobby. Um, or one time we had the um, one of the uh, student veterinary clubs come and bring baby animals oh, for the kids to meet, mm -hmm. you know, and pet. And, and uh, you know, so we try to come up with some kind of pre-show theme that um, we can partner with someone with and highlight something that is similar to the show. And sometimes mm -hmm. we have groups, sometimes we can't find anybody that, mm -hmm. that fits. Um, for example, we did Streganona, which is the story of an Italian witch who makes uh, rampant pasta machines and oh. <laughs> uh, that you know filled the whole city with pasta. Well, I really didn't have anything that fit um, <laughs> as a partner into that. So, <laughs> so uh, we made pasta necklaces that day and I you know um, I made colored pasta at my house for the, like an entire week to have enough of it to to do it. but the kids had a great time making pasta necklaces and we would have little kits available for them to to do that That's wonderful. Um, you know so we try to find something that that fits the theme we've had yeah. great luck with working with the science departments and uh, Women in Engineering has been mm -hmm. very generous to help us with, for instance, um, when we did The Big Bad Wolf and the Three Little Pigs, you know, they brought demonstrations uh, for the kids to understand why a straw house wouldn't last or, oh, how fun. you know, why a brick house would. And, uh -huh. and, and uh, you know, just try to try to expand the educational experience a little bit for, for the families. fantastic, I think. So did you, were, were you the one who kind of placed more emphasis on partnering in this way with what you were doing with school children and the departments at Purdue who could work with you? Well, yes. I mean, as, we, uh, as part of my job as, as assistant director, mm -hmm. I was in charge of education and outreach mm -hmm. activities. So 
uh, it, it was purposeful um, by the director that we wanted to expand in those areas. So That's great. That's really good. Um, I'm thinking about all of the different kinds of people that you worked with and what a challenge and an and incredible opportunity that must have, be, have been for you. And I'm wondering if there was like a particular booking that you were challenged by that you felt really proud to get? Oh, or... God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's so many different genres that we work with that mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, and you know, I. I'm, I'm never really fond of these kinds of questions because mm -hmm. I think they're kind of limiting. I think that each each of the bookings that we do brings a different challenge. Sure. Um, I'm often surprised uh, at the people. You know, sometimes you think the ones that are the most famous um, will be the most challenging to work with, mm -hmm. but sometimes that's just not true at all. They may be the easiest to work with. Um, whereas somebody who's a little newer to fame may have a little more d difficulty managing their ego when it comes mm -hmm. to to those kinds of things. Uh, we've had just so many marvelous, talented, genius people here over the years. It's just really been a wonderful experience. I can't think of any job I could have had that would have given me that range of experience. Yeah. Have you, have you just out of curiosity, maintained contact with any of the people that you brought in? Mm, no, not really. No. That's really you know, not really our job. We're just really supposed to be helpers and, and um, you know, make the day go well for them. Right. You know, I think the reward of all that has been that Purdue has a fabulous reputation mm -hmm. uh, in the industry, uh, not only as a programming entity, but also as a place that uh, people know that when they come here, they're going to be cared for, their needs are going to be met. They're probably going to have a pretty enthusiastic audience, and, yeah. and that's where the work comes in. I'm sure that's key to everything, is having that reputation of trust to to book people who have a lot of different opportunities of where they're going, yeah. that they feel comfortable right. being here. That's fantastic. Um, well, I know that it's probably difficult to select favorites, but is there a particular program that you just really felt like was particularly inspirational or impactful for you that you you know that it always sticks out in your mind? I guess. I think maybe um, I'll point to the Yo Yo Ma experience mm -hmm. uh, because um, that was particularly challenging because the day of the performance. Um, I don't know if they actually um, said it was a tornado that day, but it was at the very least um, straight line winds. Uh, he was, we were like 10 minutes from opening the doors. He was already here, ready to play. And uh, all first we had the warning mm -hmm. of, uh, of the storm coming through and we had to evacuate everybody over a thousand people to the basement of Stewart Center to wait out the storm uh, and then all the power in the building went down and of oh. course we weren't able to have the performance Oh no! and uh, uh, he was gracious enough to come back and reschedule us um, a year later that's and do that nice. performance for us that's wonderful well I'm sure that is a memory that sticks out in every person's mind who had to evacuate mm -hmm. that building <laughs> But it's it's fantastic that he thought so highly of Purdue that he would come back. Yes, you know, that's that's wonderful. Well, um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about your involvement with the student concert committee, just what that entailed, and you know ha how you feel that convocations it has a role to play with students at Purdue. You know a little bit more about that. Student concert committee evolved out of a need um, put forth by students. Uh, to have a way of expressing their own desires for music. At the, at the time that the Student Concert Committee perform, uh, was formed, um, it evolved out of what was called the, I believe it was called the Hall of Music um, Committee, which was comprised of, I believe it was faculty members and um, members of the sororities and fraternities, and then I'm not sure how many independent students were involved mm -hmm. in that, but 
this was back at the time when we were just coming out of the time when victory varieties on campus were so popular. Oh, yeah. um, but and coming into the uh, era of rock and roll um, full force and students and faculty couldn't agree on what was appropriate to bring mm -hmm. to campus and we had um, uh, a number of conflicts as far as um, anybody being able to agree on on anything to bring because the students obviously wanted their music and mm -hmm. faculty and staff weren't necessarily into rock and roll at that time. Mm -hmm. So in 1975, um, the committee was dissolved and Student Concert Committee, as it came to be called, was put underneath the uh, Department of Convocations um, in order to have some administrative mm -hmm. avenues for them. Now, we recently had a visitor um, just last, uh, well, what was it, over um, at Spring Fest, um, the student who had actually been the first one to book shows for Student Concert Committee was here. Wow. And he, he told us a little bit about how he helped get things started. He had some experience as a, as a promoter, a club promoter, and, um, and he worked with um, oh, Vice President I think he's not, I can't remember his name right now. It was, the, it was the vice president, I believe, before Tom Robinson in student services. I can't think of his name right it's now. Not, it's not coming to me. Anyway, um, he was an advocate for the students, mm -hmm. and um, and this, um, this student helped them understand the rock and roll world and the fact that you know the way shows were booked, and and um, uh, that most of the money went to the bands and didn't stay on campus afterwards. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was probably shocking. <laughs> yeah. And after a while, um, the the committee turned out to uh, be about sixteen people. Mm -hmm. um, that's the number we have today. I think it's fluctuated a little bit over the early years, but. Um, the first committee was very active and did one or two shows every month during the school year. They had wow. a lot of um, participation. Um, Ron Azoff, who is now the owner of Ticketmaster, his brother mm -hmm. was on that original committee, mm -hmm. and he was a um, new booking agent at the time with uh, handling a lot of talent, and so he was able to help bring a lot of, of the top acts of the time to Purdue. Oh, wow, that's great. And, uh, yeah, so that was that was a great asset in those first few years. Um, then um, I didn't actually, Don Siebold was the original um, advisor, not the original, I'm sorry, he, Mark Hummel, who was the department head, I believe, was the first advisor to the group, and then I believe Don Siebold took, over the group in around 1979 when he came to convocations and he was the advisor until um, I think Jeff Langford from our department had it for maybe a year or two before he left and then and then I took it over in 1999. Okay. Um, things have evolved a lot. Um, there was a long period of time when we had a really solid partnership with um, Jam Productions from Chicago, mm -hmm. who who was very instrumental in helping us get um, a lot of top talent here. Um, but back to your original question, um, this evolved out of the need for students to have their own means of self-expression, yeah. and uh, it's so valuable to have that connection with mm -hmm. them in in looking at at pop entertainment because it changes so fast yeah. and. Um, especially today now with the advent of the the internet and Spotify and, mm -hmm. and instant music um, careers are very short and catching people at the right time to make a successful show um, can be tricky yeah I imagine mm -hmm. so so what um, does the does the student concert committee kind of 
weigh in on selection and then convocations or does all the arrangements or do the students get involved in the logistics and setup as well? They do. Mm -hmm. um, we as a department do the contract side mm -hmm. uh, and the financial side. However, we do have students involved in understanding the finances. We teach them the okay. finances. Uh, we just, they are involved in understanding what a show is going to cost, mm -hmm. why we price tickets the way that we do, and they have a voice in saying kids will pay this, kids won't pay this mm -hmm. um, for the different shows, and um, they also partner with uh, convos at certain times um, on, it's like especially country shows or, or things like that where we know we have not only student population interested, but also um, um, friends of convocations or community oh, sure. interest as well. Mm -hmm. Pentatonics uh, a couple of years ago would be a good example of that, where um, SCC partnered with convocations and and we had a really successful show because we could market to so many different groups um, mm -hmm. and and make that a success. But we we you know we really say it's similar to a music internship and in some ways it's yeah. it's even more comprehensive mm -hmm. than that um, members are on the committee for two years and we meet weekly uh, over that uh, school year time so they have a lot of exposure to not only convocations as a business but also their own shows and what is involved in um, booking promoting marketing and um, making it a success and they're involved in all of those areas. I can see why that would be very valuable practical experience. One agent recently said to me uh, I would rather talk to a student concert committee member at Purdue than at any other school in the country because they're so knowledgeable and they, mm -hmm. and they ask such good questions. So that's, that's nice wonderful. to hear. Absolutely that, that definitely makes it all worthwhile. Well um, I know that you've talked a bit already about your involvement with the local schools and, and the community. Um, are there particular schools that you work with more frequently or how does that, how does that work whenever you're, whenever you're doing programming, for example, curricular related? Um? We've gone through a lot of different stages mm -hmm. of that. Um, at first we, we just did um, the bus in matinees and we had really good attendance at those. Um, but as you, I'm sure, are aware, uh, school life at the P-12 level changed dramatically um, after a while, and uh, being able to go out whenever they felt like it mm -hmm. disappeared, so field trips became more limited. Um, so my first solution to that was, since we could have fewer shows here, uh, we took more shows to the schools. Mm -hmm. So we took our artists and did our residency work out in the schools. And we, we took um, performers um, sometimes to just grade levels or two or three grade levels or sometimes to whole schools to do performances in the schools. So they didn't have the commitment to get a bus and leave school and, and come in. We, you know, they could come in and hear a performance for 45 or 50 minutes and go right back to class. So it was, Great. it was a lot less trouble for them. But then even that became limited because um, less and less money was available for them uh, to help support that kind of programming. Mm -hmm. We had a limited amount of funding available to, to take it to them. Mm -hmm. So um, we still do some of that but not nearly as much as we did at one time um, because it also costs us extra money to keep the artists here an extra day or two to make those things happen. And we don't ask the schools to do much uh, mm -hmm. in the way of, of supporting that, maybe about a fifth of what it would cost us to actually do it. Yeah. Um, we also uh, were involved for, let me see, I believe four years in the... Um, John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts Partners in Education program where we partnered with Lafayette School Corporation uh, and brought um, expert um, teachers in to teach teachers how to integrate arts into the curriculum. Oh, nice. And uh, we worked 
primarily with, um, well, let me see, we worked with Murdoch, we worked with Glen Acres, and then later on we worked with Edgelia Elementary, um, doing some extensive work in teaching teachers different ways that the arts could be integrated into the classroom. That was a great experience, but again, it was expensive. Mm -hmm. And there came a point where the school corporation had to withdraw their funding mm -hmm. that they were putting into it. And um, so we had to eventually drop out of that. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some funding uh, from donors that is designated for school, certain schools or certain school corporations. Mm -hmm. And so we do work more with some of those schools. Uh, but then we also have a lot of general scholarship funds, and we use that now to support scholarships across the board for the bus-in programming. So if um, a school wants to come but um, needs transportation support or needs ticket support, we'll give them a reduced price on the ticket or provide money for the transportation through these funds that we have. That's great. And then, uh, and then we also have funds that help us take some residency work still out to mm -hmm. the schools. That seems really fitting with the land grant mission of the university, mm -hmm. you know, to be giving back to the local citizens and the children. So I think it's fantastic. Um, you mentioned in an email exchange that we were having something about the Millennium Project, but I, I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about what, what the intent of that was and what the outcome of it was. Sure. Um, in the 1999-2000 performance year, we wanted to do some kind of project that celebrated life in Tippecanoe County, mm -hmm. and we wanted to find a way to connect um, students and senior citizens so uh, there was a company from Chicago called Child's Play, and one of the things that they did was uh, come into the local schools. They would do a little skit and talk about what it was like to write a story, and then they would take the children's stories that were written and go through them and choose a few uh, to create an onstage performance with. <laughs> So what we did was uh, bring them in and have them uh, perform at several of the schools that were participating in this project. Uh, we then followed that up with um, senior citizens coming in and talking to classrooms. And I would say, you know, we I think we had a lot of different grade levels, but you know, I think we envisioned this primarily as a third through fifth grade mm -hmm. uh, level project. Um, and the seniors uh, came in and talked about their lives and what it was like growing up in or living in Tippecanoe County uh, oh. over their lifetime. And then the students took that information and uh, wrote stories oh, or nice. wrote songs or poetry, whatever they felt like doing. And then um, we gleaned through some of that material. I think, oh, I think we had around 2,000 entries and um, we gleaned that down to maybe a couple hundred and then sent those to Child's Play. Uh, and from those, they, they chose, um, I don't remember exactly how many, maybe maybe seven or eight, um, and, and then created a performance out of that. Mm -hmm. And then we invited all the participants to come and, and see the performance. Oh we have a video of that show, yes. and I think it's in the archives already. That's, that's fantastic. It's yeah, it was a fun project. And very rewarding. Yeah. Yes. So we're, so the senior citizens came back to see the performances. That's great. Mm -hmm. It really seems like a good way to connect generations. Um, well, we've kind of talked about this a bit already, but you really expanded the outreach and educational opportunities for K-12 in the community during your tenure here. And I was curious what some of your strategies were that led to this growth and success. Well, I, you know, I think for us seeing the changes that were going on in the schools as far as, at the time, the value of, that was being placed on the arts, uh, we, we saw a change in momentum um, where um, music classes and uh, were, were being cut down to maybe once a week or choir classes being 
relegated to after school activity, mm -hmm. um, art classes going down to maybe once a week. And uh, we just felt that um, we needed to do something to keep the arts uh, as an important part of students' lives. Uh, plus, as you said earlier, uh, we felt it part of our duty as part of a land grant institution to engage the community. And I think, uh, obviously, President Jiski, when he was here, uh, mm -hmm. made even more emphasis with that and, and expected everybody to go out and engage in the community. Mm -hmm. So that just enhanced what we were doing. Could you talk a little bit about the curricular connections program? Sure. And what are some of the other ways maybe that um, you've worked on the impacting the teaching and learning side of Purdue life? Curricular Connections is a program uh, where we have had donors um, provide us with funds uh, to help engage professors with our organization. And uh, if a professor, uh, in the course of his classroom work, will make a class assignment or an extracurricular assignment uh, for attending a performance, uh, we will offer his students a $10 ticket to a Loeb or other venue performance and a $15 ticket to an Elliott Hall performance. So you can go to a Broadway show for $15 if you're a student. Uh, and you have the, you know, we create a code for the professor so that the student can now go online and, and purchase a ticket. And then we just kind of keep track of, of who uh, participates in that program mm -hmm. and and um, it's kind of gone up and down uh, over the years uh, partially driven by what we bring mm -hmm. uh, when we have more of a year of music and less of a year of theater we've seen um, con um, variable results uh -huh. you know because uh -huh. part of it has to do with you know in the teacher's mind how can I connect sure. you know this this performance to what I'm teaching in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so um, sometimes when we have more plays, they find more connections to that than they do a musical performance. But we've also had very good participation by um, uh, bands and music appreciation and uh, jazz appreciation teachers to, um, to help students come to their performances. And we've also tried to when possible, connect to their classrooms with um, residency work, where we would, you know, if, if their class met on a day when a performer was available, then, you know, we would try to make that part of, of the connection that we did on campus with their class and, oh, yeah. and send the performer to the class to talk to the students about career or, you know, um, what they do with their music, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we have also tried to engage professors um, in pre- and post-show discussions that take mm -hmm. place around performances. Um, and this is a major thrust for us today. We're, we're concentrating much more now on the collegiate side rather than the P-12 outreach. Uh, while we still do the P-12 outreach, um, most of our new projects are involved with uh, trying to engage classrooms uh, with performances. Mm -hmm. So uh, a couple of examples, uh, we had a group called Ethel here a year ago last January, and their performance involved um, using slides that were taken in the 1970s, I believe, by photographers where they sent them across America to show the environmental um, situations mm -hmm. in various states across the country, mm -hmm. um, some of the environmental crises that existed at the time. And then they paired that with um, new music, uh, new classical music. And so it was a multi, um, multi-dimensional, multi, um, uh, media show mm -hmm. where the slides were being shown while they were performing on stage. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. So in connection with that, we created a committee of um, experts from the Purdue community who were working with environmental and sustainability issues. Mm -hmm. And um, they did a a pre-show talk um, talking about the things that they were working with today and what they felt today's problems with the environment were. And then they were on stage for a post-show talk after the performance with uh, the performers to talk about how all this connected with what they had done on stage. And then after that, um, we took uh, their, they, they each wrote a little white paper for us and then we published that and put that online. So, oh, wow. um, you know, they had the benefit of, of having that published after, after the fact as well. Last year we did, um, we had a choreographer who um, had programmed a robotic arm Mm -hmm. uh, to um, perform with him. And so we involved um, professors in time-based art and robotics uh, to um, work with us to do, again, do a pre-show and that, but then also involved their classes Mm -hmm. in some residency work uh, with the performer and uh, did a similar kind of setup, although we didn't get to do a paper afterwards. But mm-hmm. they did a very wonderful um, pre-show overview of what's going on with robotics here and nice. and and what's going on with time-based art here, and then um, and then the performance, and then they participated in a post-show afterwards where they all talked, you know, with people about what was going on. And then uh, English was also involved in that, and uh, many of the students then. Um, wrote essays or, or reviews about yeah. the show and what, you know, how that, after t- after coming to a residency where they talked with the performer uh, and with the choreographer about what they did on stage and then seeing the performance, then they wrote an evaluation of that experience and what they learned or didn't learn from it. Oh, that's fantastic. Are there particular departments that you see a lot more participation with mm. than others or...? Uh, again, it kind of depends on what the what several things. It depends on um, what we're bringing. Mm-hmm. It depends on the lead time involved, um, and it depends on what kind of curricular connections we can all come up with um, sure. to to make the connections. Um, it, it's just very work intensive it, mm-hmm. it, trying to identify the professors who are teaching specific subjects. Um, letting them work with the material for a while and coming up with ways that they can connect to it mm-hmm. and then going to their colleagues and seeing you know, if there's anybody else that wants to participate. We've run into some situations, for instance, we had a professor who taught robotics that wanted to bring his, his uh, group to uh, participate in all this, but because it was part of a larger class where there were many sections, because all of the sections weren't doing it, mm-hmm. that limited what he was able to do. I see. Um, so um, I think we just continue to make more connections all the time. Mm-hmm. English has been a, a great participant, music mm-hmm. appreciation. Um, we've had several agriculture classes. We've had um, some engineering. And we just continue to expand on that. Mm-hmm. Um, we had an artist here last fall who... Um, was a specialist in not only world music but world protest music and we were able to take her into some classes where they were studying um, protest Mm -hmm. and uh, have her connect with them but then she also connected with an English class where she talked about writing lyrics and a music class and uh, she performed with the Black Cultural Center while she was here and she did her own public performance so you know we try to find um, artists that could connect in a lot of different ways with a lot of different groups. It sounds like it. That's incredible to involve so much of campus with an event like that. That's fantastic. Um, I guess this is kind of more of a reflective question for you, but how would you describe to someone in terms of, um, I guess, the ways that the convocation has changed or evolved during your 18 or so years that you've worked there? I think we've come from kind of a mom and pop organization that was competent and uh, and brought good 
solid performances to campus to an organization that is really recognized all over the world as an innovator and uh, has the respect of uh, the whole industry really. I, mm -hmm. you know, I just think that we've had that kind of growth um, and of course Todd is a great leader and um, has done a great deal not only to um, expand all the genres of performances that we do but also to um, find ways to um, connect to the community uh, both the Purdue community and and the larger community um, in ways that give us more visibility and um, more connections that are meaningful to more people. That's great. What do you consider personally your greatest accomplishment during your tenure at Purdue? Mm. <laughs> uh, I guess I would point to my work with the Student Concert Committee. To me that's been probably the most important thing that I did um, and certainly the most rewarding for me. Uh, I love working with the students. They're so bright and they're so articulate and they're uh, so excitable and, and uh, enthusiastic. And, mm -hmm. and I think um, maybe one of the testaments to that is that I'm still in touch with so many of them. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to, to know that they uh, got that level of, exp of uh, good out of the experience of being on the Student Concert Committee that they still value it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it sounds like you know of some people who were involved with it, who've gone on to careers in the music industry. Some and, have. Yeah. Some have gone on to be engineers or doctors mm -hmm. or, you know, a lot of different fields. And um, I would say right now we have more students that are particularly interested in being in the music industry mm -hmm. and and uh, CSCC is a stepping stone to that. But uh, early on, I think we had... Um, more students from across the board than we than we do now. Um, that just really had a love for music, yeah, and wanted that to be part of their lives. Well, it seems to me so critical that we have these opportunities for students that mm -hmm. you know we don't we don't have a, a music program really. Right. And I, I wasn't even aware of the music appreciation courses, so. Are those affiliated with, I'm assuming they're part of liberal arts somehow, but Right. I don't really mm -hmm. know what department they come through. Or Visual and performing arts. Visual and performing, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Wow, that's interesting. Students have to really try hard here to um, find outlets for music if they aren't aware of these things, like if, they're, if it's not obvious to them when they're applying. So right. So that's, that's wonderful. I can see where that would be very rewarding. So I just have one question for you left, and that is, um, in two and a half years, Purdue is going to celebrate its sesquicentennial. And I'm wondering if, if there was a piece in a, in a new book written about the history of Purdue on convocations and the impact it's had on Purdue's growth, identity, evolution, history, what, what do you think are some of the key things that should be highlighted as the ways that Convocations has contributed to the university? Well, I think in a STEM institution, uh, it offers some balance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as uh, we, let's say if we were to look at the Renaissance man, he not only had to be good in science and math, he also had to be a musician and had to be uh, somebody who knew literature and, and I think convocations can help students um, see a, a, a bigger world mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that's been uh, something that it's offered a small town in Indiana uh, is a bigger view of the world uh, a more expansive view of the world we have a lot of kids who come here who've never been to a show Mm -hmm. never been to a theater, mm -hmm. never been to a Broadway musical. And we offer them a low-cost opportunity to see some of the world's best. So I, I think it's it's been not only a cultural ambassador uh, to the university, but also to the whole region. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we've been able to 
touch a lot of lives with uh, the idea that um, the arts are valuable and the arts can be a part of your life and they can be an important part of who you are. So, um, I, you know, I think that's really our legacy. I think that's fantastic and a, and a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>